receivable, that's who owes you money. The accounts payable, that's who the business owes money to. And you can see here, Craig has also connected his credit card. So we see the arrows. So we know his credit card transactions are also importing into QuickBooks. Again, great benefit, great way to save time. For those who are familiar with how this is done on desktop, because you can also do it in desktop, uh, I will expect that you will find the way it's done in online is far easier and more clear, but you can still do it in both. Uh, looks like Craig doesn't have his visa linked, but also he has no balance. So perhaps he's paid off that card and doesn't expect to be using it anymore. So it sits there. He could go ahead and close that out if he wanted to, but it seems it doesn't bother having, you know, him having it there. He does have some tax payable. So he records that. QuickBooks will help you record how much sales tax you need to remit to the state authorities. He's got a couple of loans. A lot of businesses do. He's got equipment. I'm not surprised. So you can track your loan balances in your liability account. Again, that's all part of the financial record of your business. So you want to make sure you have those things in QuickBooks. Craig also, now we get to how he's divided up his income. So a lot of businesses have multiple sources of income. It might be from services provided. It might be from sales they've made or parts delivery. It could be from resale of something. So you can decide how you want to see your income broken down in your reports so that it makes sense to you. It's all income. It's all going to go to the bottom line. So this is really for you to be able to understand how, how it's showing and, and how the income is coming into your business, which you can then use that information to decide, wow, this area of my business is going great then. So that's terrific. Or I thought I was a little stronger in this area. Maybe I should give a little bit more attention to it, put a little more money into marketing or expand my product line if that's, you know, something like that. So dividing up your income will help you to understand how your business is doing and how to act going forward. Um, and here we've got some other services. So Craig's got landscape services he charges for. These are item types. We're going to talk about that in a minute. He's got labor. So he charges for the work as well. Uh, looks like he's got a little bit of pest control going on there. So these are the income accounts specific to this business. And then we hit the expenses and everybody's going to have expenses to their business, right? It's the way we do business. It's the cost of bringing in that income. And some of these will be set for you by QuickBooks. Again, if there's something that doesn't apply to you, you can always close it out. You can always add in things that you might want. So Craig's got his just different setup of, you know, insurance. We expect we'd see that on everybody's books. Uh, we may not see equipment rental on most books, job expenses, materials. So legal and professional, these are expenses we frequently see. So we've looked at a lot in your charter accounts, but there's one thing we haven't seen in Craig's charts of accounts, charter account. So Craig gets, you know, two thumbs up because what we don't see in his account is anything at all related to personal expenses that Craig has in his own life because personal expenses never belong in business books. It, they really need to be kept separate. If you have an account, bank account for the business, credit card for the business, bank account, credit card, credit card for personal use, keep those divided. You will be happy, happy you did. It's one of the big things I talk to new business owners about is how important it is to keep them apart. And the reason I know it's important is because I know as a bookkeeping practice, how much it costs when a company didn't because then they pay us to come in and we have to pull these two things apart and it can be very time consuming and very expensive so i encourage you if you've done it already okay you know water under the bridge stop today and move forward in a different way today so teresa do we have any questions if i take a pause on the chart of accounts and also to check my pace uh pace is great um I do not have any questions that uh, that have posted in Q and A. I have been hitting some chat things, but um, yeah, if anyone wants to put anything in Q and A about the chart of accounts, uh, I will gladly uh, push those to you. Perfect. Okay. Well, then I'm going to continue on, Teresa. If someone pops something in there, I can always jump back to chart of accounts. So what I'm going to talk about next is the product and services setup, and we're going to do some examples. We're actually going to add some information into Craig's account. So I'm gonna to go to over to the gear icon and then I'm gonna explain what this is, so lists. So this is the lists page. Companies have lists of things. You might have lists of customers, 
list of your products and services. Your chart of accounts is actually, as you can see here, considered a list. The terms, as we see, um, the terms of, you know, you might have this customer has 30 days to pay, this one has 90, but this one only has 14. You know, you can decide and it will preset that. So there's different lists that you have as a business owner. We're going to talk right now about products and services. We're going to add in two different things so you can see how it's done. And then we're going to go ahead after that, we're going to review the customer center and we're going to go ahead and put in an invoice using what we just did. So again, if you remember, we got to lists by going over to the gear icon, going to all lists, and I'm going to go to products and services. And we're going to see that Craig's already got some stuff in here, right? Because we know he's got a thriving landscape business. So just take a little bit of a look at what he's got to put it into context, and then we're going to add a couple. So Craig has a service of design that he sells, and he sells it at $75 a unit, which I would imagine would be an hour. So when he is creating an invoice and he, he's in design service, it's going to bring up $75, and he can put in how many, either a portion of 75, maybe they only did half an hour, or maybe it was three hours. So he's going to be able to do that. Looks like he's got some fountains that he sells, concrete pump and rock fountain. Sounds beautiful. These items are taxable. So Craig knows when he puts it on an invoice, the tax is automatically going to be added, whereas his service is not. We don't have the taxable here. From the same screen, we can look at the SKU number that Craig has assigned to this item. It's an inventory item, what it's called, what it costs what he sells it for, what it's going to cost his clients, his customer for that item, and what his cost is. And he knows how many he has on hand. So when he's preparing his invoices, he knows he's got enough if he wants to go ahead and quote this, might help him with the time frame of you know, when he can deliver that service. And the same, we look at the rock fountain, fewer on hand, makes sense, it's a pricier item. Um, costs him 125, he sells it for 275. Maybe it's not as common, so he's got a little bit lower inventory number on that. Could also mean that, you know, they sell like great guns and he's only got two left and maybe he started with far more. And some more services. Now he's got his services, lighting. He does garden lighting, rocks, some landscaping. So we're starting to see hopefully the pattern that we have here with how, what he's got here, sod, you know, for whatever reason, he didn't put in a sales price and cost entirely up to Craig. If he did want to add it, he could just go into edit and it would bring it up. Here's his sod. If he has a skew he wanted to put in it, he could do that. And he could go ahead and add the sales price um, that he has for that. It's entirely up to him. And perhaps it's a service he doesn't provide so much or he prefers to key it in. It's clearly not an item he would stock. So uh, he can at any time go in and modify any of these. Um, he can also, if we click on the drop down arrow, he can make them inactive. He could run a report specific to that, that type. He could duplicate it if he had another one that was going to be similar. And he said, oh, you know what? I can copy a lot of this, change a couple words and save me, save me a little bit of time. He could do that. He could adjust the quantity if he's finding his, his actual inventory doesn't match what he has in QuickBooks change the starting value and reorder. So all kinds of things. So that's what the carrot drop down, the edit will allow him to go in and just make a modification. So we're gonna go ahead and we're going to add a new one today. So we're gonna go up to new. If you're using QuickBooks for the first time and you have a list of these and you wanna import them into QuickBooks, you can do that with the drop down and go ahead and click import. We're going to add two new ones. We're going to set up um, a new service and we're going to call this design services. We don't have an item number for that. And here's our category. I'm going to see if we're going to put it a uh, sub of design or put it in the design. And his design services, he sells for $100. There's no inventory to track. There's no cost to track. We're just going to go ahead and add this. Now, here's a chance for Craig to say, okay, I'm gonna send this invoice to the customer and this service here, this design service, we're, I'm going to have to track it back to an income account so that when they pay it, it increases, you know, it shows that my income has gone up and it helps divide that out for me. 
So we can choose an income account here and this will show Craig's entire chart of accounts. And we're going to go ahead and just keep it to services. But every item type you wanna have an income account is called mapping. So we'll map it from the invoice to the proper income account when the time comes. It's not taxable. So we're gonna say non-taxable. Um, you can in QuickBooks, if you're working in different states that have different tax rates, you can actually set up tax rates specific to the state that you're working in so that that will automatically apply it. Um, if it was something that you were purchasing from a vendor, then it would give us some more fields. And we'll see that in just a minute. I'm actually gonna put one in that has us purchasing something from a vendor so that you can see how that is. But we're just gonna do our design services and we're gonna go ahead and save that. And here's our design service right here that we just put in $100. And now let's go ahead and let's add something that he would have. We're gonna go ahead and add. And it's gonna be an inventory item. And this is going to be um, a brick fire pit. Because with everybody being outside, who doesn't like a nice fire pit? And we're gonna give it a SKU so we have that. And category, we're going to go ahead and put this as part of um, landscaping. He's got five on hand as of today's date. We're not going to put in that, well, we could put in a reorder point. I'm not gonna put in a reorder point, but I'd say, well, one of me would say when we get down to two, it's an inventory asset. So again, we'll call it the brick fire pit. And we're going to be selling this for $250. And we've got sales of product income. It is taxable. And the cost to Craig is $105. So we've got cost of goods sold because this is the cost of what it's going to cost Craig to, to go ahead and purchase it. We have the sales price. So he's gonna have some markup on that and that's gonna to go to sales of product income. If we wanted to, there was a preferred vendor that he used, we could go ahead and pick a preferred vendor or add that in. We won't do that this time. So again, so we have our inventory item, a brick fire pit, the SKU, the category, we've got a few on hand as of today's date. When we get down to do, we wanna go ahead and reorder that. It's an inventory asset because at that point when Craig buys it and it's his inventory, he's got it, it's an asset of the business. So we wanna count that, we want that to show in the financial reporting. And just our description, we could be more descriptive. If we wanted to, the sales price and it's taxable and the cost. So we'll go ahead and close this out. And then we will find our brick fire pit. Here we go, under landscaping. So that's an example of how we add a service and how we add an inventory item. So let's go ahead and let's look at the customer center and let's create an invoice. So we will go, this is the best way to go, here we go. So under sales, we're gonna to go to our customers. And here are a list of all of Craig's customers. We've got nice little display here. Does he have any estimate, estimates out? Unbilled activity. So activity that he's going to go ahead and put on an invoice. What's overdue? What's currently outstanding? And what's been paid? So nice little display here and what you have. We also have, once we're in this sales section, these match this. So we have an overview. So this is something to, to poke around at at some point to see what the overview is. You can look at it, all sales. So this will just show a straight run of all the sales you've had according to date. Invoices, sometimes you wanna look up a particular invoice number quickly and you can go ahead and you can sort it if you wanted to look at it different ways. Your customer center which we're gonna look at and the products and services, which is where we just were. So we have our customers, so we can see, and this can be customized too. It's nice to have the name of the customer and the phone number and the open balance, but you know what? Sometimes you might wanna have the customer address or have the email show. Just makes it a little bit easier. There you go. 
So that's just a quick customization that you can make. So let's look at Amy's bird sanctuary. Just see Amy currently owes Craig $239 and see what Amy's account looks like. So we look here, it looks like it's in uh, reverse order. So most current on the top down to the oldest. And it's identified as payments that have been received in the date and how much. Invoices, looks like just a little memo, a little recap of what that invoice is. We'll look at one of those in a minute. Craig uses QuickBooks to enter time in. So he can see a time charge. Looks like there's a credit memo. So perhaps they return something, the client returns something and he wanted to give her credit for that. Payments and invoices. You can also do things like change the, if you wanna see oldest to newest, click top of date. If you wanted to group and see things together and see the invoices group together, payments group together, it'll do it that way. Invoice number or number, transaction number, not always invoice. So you can sort it lots of different ways, sort it by price. So let's just take a quick peek into one of Amy's invoices so we can see what the invoice looks like. And then we'll go ahead and create one. So here's the invoice that they created for Amy. QuickBooks will automatically give it an invoice number. You can decide the starting number and it will take it from there. So you might like longer or shorter um, invoice numbers. You can go ahead and set that. We've got Amy's address here, which is great because this way the invoice can be just straight, uh, the invoice can be straight emailed to Amy, which is helpful. But you also would like to show her billing address, the terms, how long does she have to pay, the date of the invoice, and the due date. So we see here we had some landscaping soil, a rock fountain, sounds lovely. They've got a little message on their invoice. Thank you for your business. Have a great day. In this case, it added California tax. And let me see, do they have any others? Yeah. So you can, this is where I mentioned earlier, you can store different sales tax rates, depending if you're doing work in different areas or um, you can do that. So we see the balance that's due. She was taxed of 425 plus the tax and then the balance due. If you wanted to, you could attach something to the invoice. Perhaps you wanted to attach a receipt to show this is the receipt for the rock fountain. You may or may not do that. You may have other things that you want to attach. And then when it's time to receive the payment from Amy, we can go ahead and click here and it will allow us to go in and say, and save it. I think I made an adjustment there, I was asking me. And then you can go ahead and receive the payment that the customer gave you. It'll put the payment date in. If you can modify that if maybe you're putting the check in a couple of days late and you wanna to track to when she paid, how it was paid. Reference number is the check number or other note you wanna put there. I would encourage you if they pay by check to always, always, but always put a check number there. It's a great reference to go back to and where you wanna have it deposited into what we call undeposited funds. We'll talk about that in a minute or maybe you just wanna have it go right into the bank account. The amount you received, QuickBooks will fill in that amount for you. I do encourage you to always take a look at that. Once in a while, the check is made out improperly. Maybe it was made out for 293 and not 239 and you don't realize that. So it's important to do that check between the number that's written on the actual check and the amount received. The QuickBooks, like I said, will fill that in. Um, and you can go ahead and apply it. The payment looks like there was a bigger balance. She paid part, now she paid the other part and now Amy is going to be at a zero balance. We can go ahead and save it. You can do save and new if you're going to be doing another. We're going to actually do save and close. Deborah, can you real quickly show on an invoice how to change the number? For example, if you want to start it with the year dash the number. Oh, mm -hmm. Let's do that. Let's jump into creating a new invoice and let's do that right then. Okay. So great question. So let me show you one other thing too. So now we're in sales, we're in customers, and now we're specifically in Amy. You also, when you're at this point, you have this little symbol there from QuickBooks that allows you to now see all your clients, which is kind of a little handy thing if you're going in and out of clients, maybe you have a few checks that you want to receive. It doesn't default to that. It won't open it. You just have to look for that little symbol. So now let's go ahead and let's create an invoice. So now we're back on the invoice screen. And I'm going to do create invoice. And it looks like what's our drop down. We can import invoices. We're not going to be doing that. So we're just going to create an invoice. And here we have a blank invoice. So, and I'm just gonna catch up on my notes. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and create an invoice for a customer. And let me see one second. You know what, um, Teresa, the way they do it in online is different. So let me see real quick. I think for, I might have to look into this one, I'm sorry, but I think um, we go back here to set that initial invoice date. 
I will get back to that if we've got time at the end. It's a great question. It's not where I expected to find it. So I will. Okay, I, I'll write it down and we yep. can also include it in the follow up email if we don't okay, get back perfect. to it. Okay, thank you. So we're going to go ahead and go to invoices. And we're going to create an invoice. Um, yeah. All right. So we're going to select a customer. Um, and actually, if you will allow me for just a minute, what I'd like to do is I'd like to create a new customer. Why don't rather than create an invoice for somebody who's already there, this gives me the chance to show you how to create a new customer. So again, sales customers, which is how we're here. And let's create a new customer. And it's going to be a company. And our new customer is going to be called Devil Dairy. Nice little ice cream shop. And it's going to be called Denville Dairy. You might want to put the name of the owner um, so we can maybe have the display name be the name of the owner, but we actually want it to be the business name. And we'll put in the address. Um, the email address for Jack. And this will allow us to send the email, the invoice directly to him. and his phone number. And these are things you only put in one time and then you've got, if he's got a mobile number, if you wanted to put the website in, you know, you don't need to do that. The same as billing address, shipping billing, it may not play a role, but you've got your customer information in there now. Put it in once and you've got it. And we're gonna go ahead and save it. And here's Devil Dairy. And when we look, we now see Devil Dairy in our list to the left. So there's no activity here, they're a new client. If I wanted to put a note here that says, um, all work must be completed on a Saturday, any note that you wanna put there will stay there. So you can see that you might put something specific to how they wanna pay or you know a note to yourself, it's really just for you, but it's nice to have a spot to put some notes and it will keep a running list over time. If we needed to edit something, we made a mistake, we wanted to go back, we could click edit, it would bring us into that screen, we could adjust the address, the name, whatever we wanted to do. But what we're going to do is new transaction, we're actually going to do an invoice. So now, Devil Dairy comes up, we have all that information that we just put in. Um, crew number is not something we use, that's a field that you can add because you can add fields here, that's one that QuickBooks, desk or QuickBooks Online has put there. But let's go ahead and we did our design service. And we're gonna choose our design service that we put in for $100 and we, um, we provided or Craig provided a design service for the new fire pit. And it took an hour and a half to do. So I'm gonna put an hour and a half. So it will reflect that in our rate. It wasn't a taxable service, so we didn't have to do anything with that. And we've just created an invoice or part of an invoice for that design service. But now let's also, we're gonna move ahead with the brick fire pit. That's gonna fill in and we wanna charge in advance for this. It's a heftier item, there's only one. We don't need to have multiple quantity. It filled in our $200, $250 and it taxed it. So if we now look at this invoice for Devil Dairy, of course it has the California tax rate. We're not gonna change that to New Jersey for this example, but you would have the tax rate specific to the state. And it adds it up, how much the service and the product, the tax, and we've got an invoice. It filled in our message. Thank you for your business. Have a great day. If I wanted to attach something, maybe I would want to attach a copy of the design. You could do something like that, and it will go ahead and attach it. And when the invoice comes to the customer, you would see that. So I'm going to go ahead and save this information. So we know it's saved. And we could do a couple of things if you wanted to see what the invoice was going to look at before you sent it. We have our print or preview down at the bottom. And here we can take a look at the invoice and see, yep, that looks what we expect it to look like. QuickBooks will allow you to put your logo. If you wanted to have your logo, you can customize the invoice. You can definitely do that. You can change the format. It has some templates that you can use, different colors, a little different design. Um, you can go ahead and customize that. So that's just if you wanna take a peek at the invoice. You can make it recurring. 
this is not an example of a recurring invoice, but you might have, perhaps Craig would have landscape work and on the last day of every month, he's got a flat rate, he charges his client for that landscape work. He could just set it so that invoice would be recurring and go out. We have the customize button and then more a, um, let's see, copy, void, delete. So some different things here, let's see under customize. You know, you could change the style of your invoice. We're not gonna do that. When it's ready to go, you can go ahead and click save and send and it will send it right off. Or you can print it out and mail it. You can send it in an own, your own email as an attachment if you wanted to do it that way, not have it go through QuickBooks. I will say one thing I was very happy about because sometimes when you send invoices or something from another source, your client might not recognize it or that, that email might go to spam and they might never know it's there. Uh, QuickBooks will have it go from the email address you set in here. So it will look like it's coming from your email address. So it should not be a problem with clients not being able to find it or you know going to spam. So we will go ahead and save and close. And there we go. There's our invoice for Denville Dairy, $420 due on December 12th, the month from today. Any questions on that? Um, no, no I, I don't think we have any questions on, on invoicing right at the moment, um, okay. but I do have someone that wants, that does have a quick question on charter accounts that I think would be oh. suitable to address. Mm -hmm. um, when do you delete and when you de in, in, on activate? Something oh, in the chart of accounts? Is something in the chart of accounts. That's and, a how do you, and how you do that. Um, I'll show you how to do that. And I do want to mention, because you said two keywords, um, delete and inactivate. And I wish I could open that second view here, which was unsuccessful for me earlier, because it'd be nice to leave this open. But let's go back to the chart of accounts for a quick minute. You would do that by doing the drop down and making it inactive. Now, if it has a balance in the account, it should not be allowing you to make it inactive. Um, so if it's an account that, you know, a bank account that maybe you're not using anymore and at the bank at zero, but in QuickBooks, it's not at zero, you're going to have to do an adjustment to make QuickBooks be at zero so that you can activate it. One phrase that, that, that they use that I don't like is we see here, it says make an active, reduce usage. Big companies who have a lot of chart of accounts have a limited number of accounts and this that little reduced usage will say, oh, if you inactivate this, then you have one more account available to you if you've exceeded the 250 that it allows. When you do inactivate it, it's still there, but then, then they turn it from inactivate to delete it. You didn't delete it, you inactivated it. You know you inactivated it because it says right there, inactivate. For whatever reason, once it's inactivated, it says deleted, it's not deleted. But this is where you would do it. Really think about why you would want to delete something if you can live with it being there at least through the end of the calendar year when you file your taxes and it's all there it's a great idea to keep it there if you're in, in an instance where you have a lot of accounts and you're bumping up against that 250 maximum and you need to inactivate something then you need to inactivate something there's not a lot of reasons to change your chart once you have it set up i do encourage you to work with someone who could help you your score volunteer your cpa if you've got a bookkeeper someone who could help you set up that chart of account so you have it done really well that first time through and then do the best that you can to keep it that way one thing that quickbooks does not default to and it is a setting is having numbers on your chart of accounts so having every account also have a number i do encourage you to have numbers i don't know if i'll have a chance to show you that today because it helps organize the chart of accounts the numbers are grouped according to whether it's income account or expense account Having your chart of accounts organized alphabetically is not the best way to have it organized. That's the default. So if you don't have numbers there, it's going to do it by, um, by type and alphabetically. Um, so just another word about chart of accounts. But Teresa, does that sound like I hit the question? Yes, I think you did. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Well, it was great because you know what? A little bit of time went by. And now guess what? Denville Dairy paid their invoice. Woohoo! We love getting paid. What's better than getting a check in the mail from a client? So let's go ahead and let's receive that payment. So now we're going to go back to sales and our list of customers. There's Dimple Dairy. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and receive the payment. So we've got our payment date. They're fast payers. They paid us on the same day we invoiced them. Don't we love that? And they sent us a check. And that's our check number. We're going to put that right into our nice little handy dandy banking account. We're going to check. She owed 420. The check is for her 420. Excellent. 
everything looks great here. And we're gonna go ahead and save and close. And now when we look at Denville Dairy, we will see we had an invoice and it was paid and there's no balance. Isn't that great? And then if we look over to the left, no balance here either. So that's kind of the, the start to finish on that. So we created a new customer. We went ahead, created an invoice using the item types that we had just set up and then our customer paid us. Huge win all around. So now let's go see where that money hit the bank account and how. So now we're gonna shift gears for a minute. We're gonna go over to banking. I'm gonna click on the banking tab or the banking there. And, oh great, our banking connection's all set, thank you. And this is the way QuickBooks Online shows the bank accounts and in this case, also the credit card. I love this view. If you've seen it on QuickBooks Desktop, completely different to me. I love the way that this is laid out. I love desktop too, both of them. It's like children, how can you love one more than the other? But you know, they each have their own wonderful things about them. So one of the wonderful things about QuickBooks Online is the way they lay out the banking. Now we saw, if you remember in the chart of accounts, the bank account was linked to QuickBooks and that's how the transactions come in. We saw the checking was linked and the savings and the MasterCard. We can update it. So if we click here, you know, it'll do it on its own, but once in a while, you know, you click update, see if anything new comes in, but otherwise at regular intervals, it will go ahead and update it for you. And while it's thinking, we can keep moving on. And here we're going to look at the checking, checking account, which we know because it's highlighted in blue. And we're gonna see the transactions that came in from the bank in the last you know, little while. So we see here, looks like they paid their bookkeeper, Books by Bessie is the bookkeeper. Actually, it looks like their bookkeeper paid them. I wonder maybe, maybe Bessie was overpaid. Not quite sure, you don't usually see that. But in any case, so it comes in from the bank. We wanna go ahead, we can modify this and say, okay, well, Bessie, we're gonna go ahead and let me back up, I'm so sorry. So let's take a look. We've clicked on this transaction. We're gonna categorize it and then we're gonna add it right to our bank account. And it came in as books by Bessie. So the bank knew who it was. We're gonna look at um, uncategorized income. Well, we don't want our uncategorized income. Actually, let's say I, I do know that they have this set up as a bookkeeper, but let's consider it something, some other vendor um, or customer who's paying them. Maybe books by Bessie utilized their landscaping services. We'll go with that. So she's paying for the landscaping services and we're gonna go ahead and put that in an income account. So services. Now we might put a memo here. There might be a notation that we want to put in this, you know, it might be for, um, you know, a specific service or a specific date, or, you know, maybe Bessie bought something. Maybe she bought a new cover for her fire pit. We didn't invoice it. She just sent us a check. We said it's 55 bucks and she did. We go ahead and put a notation here. We can add an attachment if we wanted to. We could, could create a rule so that every time Bessie sends us something, we can go ahead and set it up. We'll do that at the end if we've got some time. But everything here looks good. So the bank imported this transaction, says the date, who it was from, we categorized its income. So we put it to services and we're gonna go ahead and add this. And it's gone from the screen and we're gonna see where it hit on the register. So we see some other entries that came in from the bank and we have the chance to modify same way, click on it, update the account. I do encourage you forever and always to put a payee. So even though it says here, and we know this was A1 rental backhoe, we want to also put this here. Let me see if they have that in there. Can we put it in? No, they don't have it there. Um, but you do always want to put in a payee name, a vendor name, and that's going to become very helpful as time goes by. But I do want to focus on this for a minute. Now, what happens is um, sometimes you key things into QuickBooks. You receive a payment from a customer and it's already in QuickBooks. And then it imports from the bank and the bank says, hey, We've got this transaction. I see you've got it too. Way to go. So rather than add and having to click and fill in any details, QuickBooks has already said, you're on it. Let's go ahead. Let's match it to what you have in there already. So you can click match and it's gone. We're going to see in a minute where it went. And this is a great set of books. It's a great example. And it looks like they've got a lot of things that they keyed in. They kept up with what was going on, the comings and goings of the money in their business. And they can just go down and they can make all their matches, you know, until they go down. Once in a while, we see something, I'm not going to do all these, but, and there could be multiple pages of them if you've got a 
a business with a lot of transactions or you haven't done the bookkeeping recently and they've built up, they may go to multiple pages. Um, and so let's go ahead and let's take a look at where these went to. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one thing I was going to show you. Um, once in a while, there's a transaction here that we know is in there, we don't want, maybe there was a little hiccup and it imported twice from QuickBooks and we verify that on our records and the bank records and say, yep, you know what? That's a second one, we don't need that. What we can do with that is click and then exclude. And what it will do is it will move it off this screen, it won't put it into the register, it'll just move it off. So that's what, you know, if you wanted to exclude something. But now we're going to go to the bank register because in particular, we wanna see how our dental dairy payment played out. We're still in checking. Again, we could click on savings, it would show us the savings or the MasterCard, we're gonna stay on checking, we're going to go to the bank register. And let's take a look. Oh, here we go. Here's our dental dairy payment, deposited $420 in our bank account. Now, the next time our QuickBooks would sync with the bank, we would see on that screen we were just on the dental dairy payment and it would say match because it would have, it would have connected it with this. And, oh, I see you've got that 420 in there, great match. And then we'll be able to see that. But now we know our payment is reflected in the bank. And it kind of closes the loop on that, you know, creating the invoice, sending it out, receiving the payment, it hits the bank account. When we see the transactions that have the C and the green box, that means it imported from QuickBooks. It's a great thing to see because it means I have the same thing that the bank had, Wahoo. So it's nice to see that. These probably haven't imported from the bank yet. And when they do, we'll see those Cs. Clear means the C is for clear. It means you moved it from the for review, which is what we call if we go back here. We call this the for review screen. I think they might have changed the, oh no, here it is, for review right there. That's what I call the for review screen. So it means you moved it from for review over. So it was an intentional move over. You can also set up something so that it always goes right to the register. It doesn't stop in the for review because you might have expenses that as the day is long, you know how they get categorized. Every time you stop at a shell station, that's gonna be gas expense. You can set it up in QuickBooks to say, every time you see something import and it says shell, just put it right into the register as gas. We know what that is. And you can do that with a number of different things. And you can do that with payments as well. So every time you see this payment that I make to Comcast, just move it right into the register because we know it's internet expense or utility expense. So you can set it and have it help you and do some of those things more efficiently and save you from having to do it. So here's our Denver Dairy payment. And if we wanted to, and we saw it was accounts receivable. It initially was an invoice and then it came to us, it was paid. It was a payment made. And if we wanted to go back, we can click here and we can go back and see, this is our payment screen to where we just were, right? 420 bucks, devil dairy. If we wanted to look at the invoice and say, what is that invoice for again? Then you could just go ahead and say, oh, right, right, right. Here's the invoice. This is what it was for. Great, done. So that's the loop that I wanted to show you with creating an invoice, receiving a payment, looking at where it is in the bank. Do we have any questions on that part? Uh, yes, uh, we do have a question. Um, she says, uh, my bank does not show the names of the person who deposited the check, only the check images. It also cannot read my handwriting on who I write the checks to. How do I enter this or how do I deal with this? Uh, well, I will say I have the same problem with handwriting. Uh, so I totally get that. No, the banks, when you write a check and the checks come in from the bank, they do not have, they do not fill in the name of who the check was from or who you sent a check to. So if you have a check that you wrote and you want to, you see that it comes in under payment, the checks need to be filled in. You can fill them in. If it's a check you're writing, so you're paying a vendor, you can fill it in, create it here as you do it. So you're, if you're handwriting checks, which it sounds like you are, you handwrite your check, get it set to mail, turn to QuickBooks, key it in. I use on this date, this check number, this is who it was to, this is what it was for. And then when it comes in from the bank, it'll match it because it'll recognize the date, it'll recognize the amount. Once in a while, it doesn't match right, so we keep an eye on it, but in general, it's gonna do it well for you. Um, checks are a handwritten activity. So um, when you get checks from clients, if it's an invoice and you're receiving it against an invoice like we just did, then it will match up because it will recognize again the date and the amount. But otherwise, the bank doesn't. And I think for the very reason you mentioned handwriting, if it's a check card, so you go to a business and you use your ATM card to make a payment. That will capture, because it's an electronic payment, that will capture what that business has and what's noted for their business. So then when it does come in from the bank, you will see it. And actually, I think there's an example here that I can show you that. Let's see if we have anything here. 
um, deposit. Let me see, it might be squeaky clean. Here, if we look here, bank detail. This was probably play, paid, you know, in our fictitious Craig's here with an ATM card or a credit card or something where cash came in and you have that. Checks, you do not get that. So does that sound like it mm -hmm. answered the question? Yeah, and I think too, something to consider is, um, having if your checking account is with a bank that is quickbooks compatible have consider having the bank uploading your checks to the bank and having them send them out too yep. is another way to avoid that problem yep so yeah and that happens and i see that with clients you know some checks even that you can deposit by phone and other checks they can't do because they can't make out the numbers as clearly right so, Debbie, i wanted to give you a time check it's a, just a few minutes after 10. okay all right, great. Well, then let's move into our vendor center. Um, we talked about bank feeds, so we're going to move into vendor center. I will pick up the pace a little bit, um, largely because the vendor center looks a lot like the customer center, so it's not going to be that new to you. So let's go ahead and look at vendors, because there's a couple things I want to say about vendors. Looks a lot like the customer center. We can go ahead and, oops, I didn't want to do that. I want to click this one. If we wanted to get some more details like our um, the address, uh, um, the address, here we go. Some more details on our vendors we can. Vendors are entered exactly the same way as customers are, but let's look at, we'll stick with our books by Bessie because we like her. And we can see Bessie um, billed the client $75 and the client paid. So here we see, but let's, and then if we click here, you may remember this from the customer center. Now we have a list of all our vendors, which is kind of a handy thing to have. But let's go ahead and let's add a new vendor. There's a couple things in this time of year in particular that are important to say. So we're gonna add a new vendor. So if you look at it, very similar to the customer layout where we add a customer or a new customer, we're now gonna do a new vendor. Again, super similar, right? Looks a lot like the other. So let's see, we'll set up a customer, I mean, a new vendor. Um, and we're gonna do lose printing. And uh, Lou prints all our signage, we love Lou. So we'll go say, here's Lou Lou's printing. We could put his name here and do that. We're just gonna have it, Lou's printing. And we can put the address. And he's also in Denville. So put in as much information as you can here. Um, it's going to help you later. Any notes you wanted to put in. Again, these are just notes for your reference. Any attachments? You can put in Lou's email. You're not going to be sending Lou an invoice. You can put in his email if you want. You know, it's not going to be critical in your work. Certainly his phone number, any terms that you have, an account number. Again, this is for your reference. But now we're going to get to something really important. And that is right here, track payments for 1099. Because as business owners, um, you probably know, and if not, you'll learn quite soon that every January you need to send a 1099 to um, any vendor or anyone who you paid what's considered non-employee compensation. So we paid Lou to print our business cards and a couple other things. And you know, so we spent about $650 on Lou. There's a threshold and that is anytime you pay a vendor $600 or more, so not more than $600, $600 or more. So if you paid him 600, he gets a 1099 and you need to track that information. As a business owner, you are required to do that and they need to have it in their hands this year by February 1st, because I think January 31st is a Sunday. Otherwise, it would have been January 31st. So we have until February 1st this year. Before I were to pay Lou a penny, even if it was only a $150 invoice, I would give Lou a call and say, Lou, I want to pay you. I need your W-9. He would say, okay, great. And he would send it off to me by email. The W-9, and you may have one for your own business, I would imagine you do, is the document that will give you all the information you need to do the 1099 for Lou. Now, even though I'm only paying him $150, there's a chance I may pay him $600 before the end of the year. It's always smart to get that W-9 upfront because if you've got a check and say, hey, I've got this check, I'm ready to pay you, send me the W-9. They're gonna send that W-9 to you faster than saying, hey, Lou, I need to report to the federal government that I paid you more than $600. Can you send me that W-9? Huh. He might still do it, hopefully he will, but the motivation's kind of tanked a little bit there. So always, always get your W-9 up front and you can fill in either the business ID or the tax, you know, social security number of the business ahead of time. And you can attach that W-9 right here. So you've got it all in one place. So that's my little timely thing that I wanted to tell you about vendors and W-9s. But we've got lose information in there. And now when we look at our list of customers, 
we see Lou. And we can go ahead and now we've got our list. Uh, Lou sends us a bill. Let's go ahead and get Lou paid. So now we're gonna go to uh, award the vendor already. We have new transactions and we're gonna enter a bill. So I've got my bill from Lou in front of me and I see Bill, I mean, Lou likes to get paid within 15 days. It's a good thing for me to have for my record. Bill number could be the invoice number or whatever Lou calls how he was invoicing me. And um, this was advertising, you know, he did some printing for me and I could say the office moved. So I had new business cards and signage and it was $650. I'm not billing it forward to a client, which is what this billable button would be. So if it was something where a vendor billed me that was then gonna go on the client invoice, I could do that. I don't need to do the tax. It's all incorporated in his price here. It's not tied to a customer. So I don't need to put anything there. So this will show me in my records, I owe Lou $650. I could schedule the payment if I wanted. I'm just gonna go ahead and save it. And then I know it's gonna be time to, when it's time to pay Lou. I can click here and I can go ahead and issue the payment. Uh, maybe schedule online payment. Oh, no, 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 we don't wanna go there, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm just gonna go back, there we go. Um, I can go ahead and pay Lou and then he's all squared away there. So little quick and dirty on the vendor, are we okay? Because I would like to get to some reporting. Um, yeah, go ahead on the reporting. Okay. All right. Again, if we go back and we look at our left hand side, we've got our options here and we're going to click reports. QuickBooks has what can only be described as a plethora of reports available for business owners. But what I do like is they pull the top three right here. Um, profit and loss, also known as the income statement, balance sheet and here actually accounts receivable aging. We also talked about statement of cash flow. Accounts receivable aging is important if you're someone who invoices, that would be one of your top reports. But let's go ahead and look at a profit and loss and let's just talk about what it is for a couple of minutes, just as a basic. So this, it has defaulted to this year to date, but if we wanted to look at certain date range, maybe we wanna see a lot of times what we wanna look at is how we did last month or last quarter. So if we look at last month, we'll see what kind of information's in there. So we'll set the dates. We can talk about how we want it displayed. We just have a total column. Um, and any other customization, whether we're on accrual books or cash, I'm gonna change this to cash. This, we talked about a little bit earlier underneath the gear icon where you can go ahead and set it to accrual or cash. And we're gonna run the report. And now we're looking at last month and we can take a look at how things looked for the business last month. What came in in revenue? So we've got our total income here, what it cost. So what went out in cost of goods sold and our net revenue. So gross profit, our gross profit. From there, we can look at all the expenses that we had that Craig went and put in advertising and automobile. I think our date for advertising for loose printing was November was this month. Otherwise, if it was October, we would have seen it here. Um, anytime we want to click on something and say, you know, what was that about this job materials? Let me click and see and be reminded. And it will show us what makes up that category and that total. And then if we wanted to look at it even further, we could drill down to that actual expense. So again, the nice thing about the way online does it makes it really easy to look at it as a general and then get back and drill down and say, okay, what exactly was that? And we're back. Legal and professional fees, and then bottom line. And let's go back and look at the balance sheet. So balance sheet, another vital report different set of information, different way to look at the business. We're gonna change this to last month and cash basis and take a look. So this shows us, profit and loss shows us the comings and goings of money with the business. How much money went in, where it came from, as far as general type of income, and then what went out. The balance sheet tells us what the assets and the liabilities and equity of the company are. So this tells us as of this point in time, October 31st, these are the bank balances checking, savings, undeposited funds. That means checks that they received in QuickBooks but haven't hit the bank yet. So you still have them, there's still revenue, they're gonna move over, but right now they're not in the bank yet, but you wanna count that because it's an asset, it's, it's what you have. And the truck, he owns a truck. 
We can look at the liabilities, how much he owes to MasterCard again on this date at this time, according to what's in QuickBooks. Um, if they've got any liabilities, payables, a loan that, that Craig's paying down. So you wanna make sure you have any borrowed money, even if it's money from you that you put into your company. If you're considering a loan, you wanna put that on your books so that you have that. Notes payable, looks like he's got a bigger loan there as well. Opening balance equity, we're not gonna talk about the equity section today, but this is the balance sheet. And ideally the total liabilities and equity here, 17 by 52 match all the assets. 17, 52. I think twice in my career, I've seen where it didn't match. It's very rare um, because QuickBooks will kind of do the math to make it match. So this is your balance sheet. And again, if we just say we'll go to reports, it comes up automatically. If you wanted to look at your accounts receivable. So for those who will be invoicing, this is a report you'd want to look at, you know, I would say several times a month. And this shows us all the customers how far out their invoices are. It looks like nobody over 91 days, so far, nice. Um, and you can see who owes you money, so you can make those phone calls and say, okay, you know, John, I've had this invoice out there for a bit, one to 30, it's not bad, you probably wouldn't call John. You might call Cookies by Kathy and say, Kathy, we have a net 30, and I'm still looking for that $75 invoice. And again, if you've got, you wanna go from here and you've got Kathy on the phone, click on it and you can say, oh yeah, it's invoice number 1016, and we sent it on August 29th and you can have all of that. So that's your accounts payable report. And let's go back and we'll just look at that cash flow. And you can also search statement of cash flow. And we can do, we'll do last month just to keep consistent and report. And this will just show you kind of throughout the month what happened with your cash. So again, reports, and it will take you here. It will group the reports. If you want to look at some different things, maybe our profit and loss here just shows uh, the summary. But if you wanted to look at the breakdown, you can look at a report that just shows you all the breakdown. And I'll just show you as an example here. So we're on our first report. We just saw under design income, we just saw the total. This report will give you more detail, which is sometimes what you're looking for. And you can take a look at that. All right, so that was what I wanted to go over for reporting. I know that was pretty quick. Any questions we do, I think have some time though for me to do a little more detail here if someone would like. Okay, yeah, if anyone wants to post into Q&A questions over the vendors and reporting, uh, we can try and answer those questions. Uh, while we're waiting for those to come in, I'm gonna go ahead and put the poll up. Oh, no, my poll's not going to work today. Uh, we do not have a poll on today. Uh, are you <laughs> so sure? that's okay. No problem. It's not a big deal. Um, somebody's asking about, what about for a 990? Hey, that's all they have. Yeah, I think that's the 990s, the payroll, when you're looking for, right, 941, 990. Um, that, I'd have to check. I think, if I'm remembering right, that is the payroll report, you would only get that from QuickBooks if you were running QuickBooks, you know, running, oh no, that's 940 and 941. Sorry, getting my numbers mixed up. Let me find out about the 990. I am not certain. Okay. And I can, just, um, I can get back to you and maybe that can be a follow-up uh, sure. afterwards. Uh, um, somebody's asking about uh, what, what, a, what an audit log is. Oh, audit logs are lovely. So let me get back to see if we can get an audit log. Oops. There we go. This is, there's probably other ways to get to the audit log. It might be under the gear or under the plus side. I plus sign, I tend to do it this way. So the audit log is nice because it does allow you to go back in and look at what happened in your books and who did it. So if you do have multiple people using your books, you've got yourself or a spouse, yourself and someone who's helping you, um, make sure everyone has their own um, login because that will allow you to see what happened and when. And here, you know, these are all transactions. You know, I'm not sure if these are what I did because the timing doesn't match up. But this is what an audit log does. It allows you to go in and to be able to see what was changed and when. And sometimes it's just a really handy tool when things go awry or you can't figure out, I thought I put this in and now it says that. So audit log, you can find by going, one of the ways you can find it, the way I find it is going to reports and typing in audit log. They also have an audit log in QuickBooks desktop. 
works a little differently. But this kind of just puts down everything that's happened in the company by date. And that's why it's great to have different logins. It sometimes helps out too. What we didn't get to talk about, and I think I have a minute, I might jump into it when it comes to the bank reconciliation. And when you go to reconcile and everything reconciled last month and something's off this month and you're trying to figure out why, the audit log will also, um, oftentimes help you figure out why that's not matching up. So just to go to reconcile for a minute, actually, I'm going to back up to show you where I got it from. So I went into the checking account and reconcile in the top right-hand corner. And I'm going to excuse myself for a second while I call. <coughs> oh, I apologize. And we're going to go ahead and look at the reconciliation. The first time you're in QuickBooks Online, it wants to give you a lot of help. And that's the pop-ups that we see. So we'll go here and look at our checking account. We might choose to do a different one that defaults to checking. Our beginning balance, which we want to match the statement. I don't actually have a statement for Craig's. Our ending balance, according to the bank statement, and the date that our statement ended, which is usually the last day of the month, but not all statements end on the last day of the month. So this will match my statement. That will match my statement, and I'll start reconciling. And QuickBooks, this is one of the really fun things about QuickBooks, is it will go in and help you do the reconciliation, uh, perhaps not on this one because it's our test database, but it will go ahead and start to recognize what's here. And you follow your bank statement and you just check off everything that's on your statement to match in QuickBooks. If you have something on your statement and it's not in QuickBooks, double check. It looks like maybe an entry that just didn't get added. So you're likely going to want to add that. If you have something on your statement on your, in QuickBooks that's not on your statement, you want to look into that too, especially if it's something like a deposit, like, oh, I got this deposit from a customer. I was pretty sure I deposited it, but the bank doesn't have it. Let me see what's going on there. And the closer you do the reconciliation to the end of the month, the easier it's going to be to check any of those things that seem a little bit off. Because the more time that goes by when there's a transaction that's off will never be helpful to you. Uh, checking things sooner will be, will be the way to go. And when it reaches zero, it will give you the option to go ahead and reconcile. And then you know on that day at that time for that time period, what you have in QuickBooks and what you have in the bank match. And that's a really good feeling to know. If you start to see over time, gee, I've reconciled two or three times, but I have this, this check that so-and-so never cashed. I wrote them a check. Um, perhaps you wrote someone a check for helping in the office. They came and moved some furniture and I paid them $150 and that check hasn't been cashed. Give them a call, send them an email. Say, I wrote you this check. It hasn't been cashed yet. Chances are they're going to say, oh, you know what? I misplaced it or, oh, I forgot I still have that. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Um, you might have to replace it. But in any case, as a business, you owe that money to them. So you want to make sure you track them down and say, hey, you know, I wrote you this check, you haven't cashed it. Did you lose it? You need another. The reconciliation will help you identify those times. Um, so I do require, I do recommend, I'm sorry, the reconciliation should be done as close as you can. If another month goes by, you're busy, business is great, you've got a lot going on, terrific. Um, but you always do want to mind that your bank and QuickBooks matches at the same time. Um, I did want to mention something that I, I forgot to mention earlier, and that is, you know, what we do here at Harmony with regard to bookkeeping is helping help customers and helping small businesses. And we have a lot of companies who like to do a lot on their own because they're small and they can, and we like to support that effort. So if anyone's interested, I do have a top 10 things to do before you close the year list that I'd be happy to email out to anybody. That would be a handy tool for you to have. You can just go ahead and put your email in the chat or in the, um, you know, to the presenters or to the panel. And I'll go ahead and I'll send one of those out to you. And it's just a checklist that you can use. It's a handy tool, especially now that really the end of the year is kind of upon us. Um, so that was jumping into just the reconciliation a little bit. Would it be okay, Teresa and Gloria, and if the attendees have time to just go a little bit longer so that I can talk about the classes and show people how to turn that on? I'm okay with that. Okay. All right. And I'll have this be the last thing, and then we'll have a little bit of time for questions because I did mention earlier in the presentation about sometimes dividing things into class, either by location, you know, different things that you'd want to divide out. Uh, perhaps you own properties and you want to divide it by property location. Maybe you have multiple locations of your business or different ways. But I just wanted to show you how to turn on the classes. And this takes us back to our gear icon that we talked about earlier and our accountant settings. And let me see. Yeah, I think it's under this one under expenses. Nope. I think it's here. 
And let me just see where we have to turn on the, um, oh, there we go, sorry, Let's start again. Um, gear icon, account and settings and advanced. So it took the long way to get there. And here is where you would turn those on. So the pencil means it's a field you can edit and you would wanna turn on classes. You might wanna say, I want everything classed. So if I forget to put a class in, give me a little sign. When you have that checked, you'll get a little pop-up that says, you know, you didn't assign a class to this. You can override that, or it can be your reminder to go back at, to assign a class. And you can, it's showing here to set one to each row and transaction. And you can also do locations if you wanted to set locations. And then you can go ahead from your lists that we saw before, you can set multiple locations. And this is how I'm going to turn off the locations for now and just go with classes. And to be warned, and you can go ahead and save that. And now when you go to record transactions, it will ask you, would you like to assign a class to this transaction? It will also, when you do the reporting, let you say, let's see if we um, can do a report and track by class. So I'm just jumping through to get to a profit and loss. And Sorry, here we go, customize. And we can filter by class. And unfortunately this example doesn't have anything classed out, but if it did, it would give us another way to see that as well. Um, and that's under the customized feature. So a little quick on that one too, but again, another handy tool. Um, that's what I have as far as just the kind of the basic overview can we open up for some questions? Um, yeah, I do have one question asking about, uh, do you know what version of QuickBooks Online the sample is? Let me see, that's a good question. Uh, let's see if it tells us. I don't know if I know that. I know I don't know that. And I am sure the answer is here. What I can do again is find out and let you know. Um, I'm going to guess that it is, um, I think the pro level because of the class tracking. The, the lowest level that QuickBooks offers is, um, it has a great price point. I think it's $7 a month because this is a monthly subscription. It tends not to have the features that most businesses want. I would discourage you from that one because I think in pretty short order, you're going to end up upgrading to the next level anyway. Um, so uh, simple start, I believe is what the lowest one is called. You know, not my favorite. So I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that for sure. Okay. Um, I, I want to say that um, I have typed answers to some of the Q and A. Um, some people aren't seeing the answers. Um, in particular, there is one person that asked about um, how to um, process payments when you don't have a customer. Uh, that is something we did not get to today. And mm -hmm. I will be happy to provide that information separately to this mm -hmm. person. And it, it is not difficult to do. So um, it'll be a, unless you want to kind of touch on it super quick. Yeah. I can, what that would be, so it's a great question when you're not invoicing and you have a payment. And really you can go, there's a couple ways. You can go to the bank register and you can go ahead and add. So add a deposit and it will let you fill it in, who it was from, memo. Now we have this class showing up, which we didn't have before, you know, payment. And you can go ahead and save it right here. So, and that again was just by going to banking and going to the bank register and putting it right there through here. And if you do the drop down, you have a choice of what you'd want to do there. And I believe you can also do that under the new. And um, no, that's not what I want to do. Uh, I think there's a way to receive a payment. Here it is. And this will just let you to receive a payment. Uh, this is if you have a, if you wanted to track the customer. But otherwise, going to banking. Um, you do not have to have, if we go here again, deposit, you don't have to have a payee. You don't have to have a who it's from if it's a deposit. 
you can skip over that. Maybe you want to put something in the memo and put the deposit and what account it goes to, but you do not have to have a payee to record a deposit. Does um, that answer that question, you think? I, I, hopefully, and if it doesn't, um, she can definitely either email you or, or uh or score and we can okay. uh, answer that further. Um, somebody's asking about the nonprofit version and how that would compare to the online version. Is there a difference? I'm gonna say yes, but maybe you'd like to expand on that a little bit. <laughs> I have that a little bit with nonprofit. The differences I noticed is how the chart of accounts is set up. So it's set up a little bit more specifically to a nonprofit than to a business. But I think the bigger difference you're gonna see is this down the side these it's it's going to be labeled differently um and those are the two big differences that i see with that is really just it's the same product just a little bit different layout and focuses a little bit more on the categories that would be appropriate for a nonprofit versus a business okay uh, another question on reports um is there a way to run cash flow um, projection as a chart um it doesn't do cash flow projection so what it will do is it will show us cash flow. Um, and let's see, I think you can export it. Let's see if we can. You can definitely export it on a desktop. I, say, I believe Excel. you can export it into Excel. And then you can make your chart from there. Yeah. 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 So any of these you actually can export to Excel, uh, which is how, or a PDF too, which is also helpful. Um, I am not seeing any other questions. Um, if you want to just put up, do you want to put up your contact information? If anyone wants to contact you directly. Um, also, please, if you would like a SCORE mentor, put that information in chat and we're happy to reach out to you. Or you can also reach out to uh, SCORE with your questions as well. Um, I will. Yep. And I did just want to put up the slide for where can you get training for QuickBooks. So there's lots of different places. They don't all cost. You can get free training. If you have access to a database called lynda.com, which some public libraries have access to, it's a great, great resource. A lot of nice videos they even give you little quizzes along the way to help you make sure you're understanding that. YouTube to no end um, and some different ways. And really these QuickBooks for dummies, they have a place, you know, they can be a really handy resource for you. Um, so yeah. So, and if you'd like that top 10, just go ahead and put your email in the, in the chat for the panelists and I'll go ahead and get that and I'll send that out to you. I think I've captured quite a few of those emails for you. Oh, good. Good, good. Um, so I'll, I'll let go, Gloria go ahead and, um, do a closing for us. Uh, yes, I was just, there you go. Uh, so anyway, yes, if you, um, would like to have a counselor contact you to schedule a meeting. Again, regarding anything about your business, not just QuickBooks, uh, email me at uh, gloria.spence at scorevolunteer.org. And um, any comments you have about the, uh, the actual workshop, or if you think a different format would be better, we are open. As, as Deborah mentioned earlier on, this was um, our first time doing it uh, this way. And so we would appreciate your feedback. And um, again, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you uh, got something out of it. And uh, we will see some of you again tomorrow at nine o'clock for the desktop version. Great. I wish everybody the best with their businesses. Good luck. Thank you. Bye-bye.